All right, coming up next, she's been furiously writing notes, taking notes. She was up late, because as you'll see from her attire, she is a Cubs fan. Not only that, more importantly, she is an international child's rights and women's advocate. She's been doing that kind of work for a long time. She's a retired clinical associate professor at Northwestern University's School of Law and the founding director of the Children and Family Justice Center. She's been doing that for 24 years. I think I met you about 24 years ago interviewing for you a piece, interviewing you for a piece. And um, let's hear it for Bernadine Dorn. Well, I did uh, stay up all night, and I did just fly in from Cleveland. And, uh, <clears throat> but I'm actually talking about something not that funny. So. I, <clears throat> I think you should do a program sometime just asking people about what book they first think of when you get invited to come here and speak about books that change your life and then how many you reject along the way um, once you look at the website and see what other books have been talked about. So I, I <clears throat> decided to reject James Baldwin and Doris Lessing and many books that I thought of because boom, into my mind came the fact that there was a book in 1958, 1958, when I was in high school in an all-white suburb of Milwaukee, White Fish Bay, known awful, really quite frequently people say to me, White People's Bay, which it was at the time. And I had an experience, a, really a crazy kind of experience, because a renegade guy came in as a teacher. And his name was John Paul Jones. I don't know where he is. I, I don't know what, well, I do know what happened to him, because two years later, when I came home from college to visit, I heard that he'd been fired by the John Birch Society, among other things for having students over to his house, having us drink wine, having candles lit in the floor and everything. This was the 50s. So this was uh, a high crime and misdemeanor. In his class, I read a book called La Question, The Question. I don't know if he suggested it to me. I knew nothing about the world. This was a guy who said to our class the first day, what, what percentage of people do you think Americans are in the world, on the earth? We were, I remember, I think I guessed something like 60%. I had no idea where we were in the world. I used to sit next to the maps, but I actually had no idea that it was 6%, of course, of the world's people. That's kind of the bubble I grew up in. Somehow I got this book, La Question, by Henry Alleg. I just looked it up. Of course, it pops right up. It was a book about torture in Algeria during the Algerian War for Independence. Some of you are nodding. You know, remember, you know this book. Um, uh, he uh, was a journalist. He ran a newspaper, independent newspaper uh, in Algeria. And he, um, he uh, was arrested by the French authorities occupying and trying to subjugate Algeria. And he uh, went, went into prison, was moved around to various prisons. He was tortured, obscenely tortured, uh, um, by French paratroopers. He was in Barbosa prison. He smuggled out page by page, much, much like Martin Luther King did in what book? Uh, that he wrote while he was in prison, um, you, know, uh, were, you know, page after page through his lawyers, um, smuggled out this book, which became the question, and described water torture, torture by electric shock, and um, summary execution, taking somebody out to be shot. Uh, the French government censored, and it became a book in France, and it shocked the French consciousness, so much so that it was banned in France. Um, after selling about 60,000 copies in the first few months. It was a bestseller on this topic. Um, and it was, he, was, he was charged with demoralizing the occupation of, of Algeria. Um, pretty interesting, isn't it? Kind of crazy. So, uh, but within the end of that year, because the cat was already out of the bag, there were already 162,000 copies circulating in France. And it was about how torture and terrorizing of political opponents was an inter integral part of war and occupation and colonization. Now, I read this book. I must have written a report about it. It wasn't the internet era. I couldn't find the report now. I don't know how to find anything. 
but it, I, it must have planted, se it planted seeds. All these years later, 50, 50 years later, 48 years later, I began to teach torture during the Bush administration at Northwestern Law School, a, a course called Torture, a Paradigm. And of course, at that moment, we had the United States government whitewashing, so to speak, torture, right? Torture of anybody, political opponents, all the people who were sent to get Mo, Abu Ghraib revelations about everyday torture. And so I developed this course that began with lynching, began with the American empire, um, and kind of wound its way around to Cook County Jail, right here, what, three miles from here? 9,000 African American Latino people in jail, basically for want of cash bail. And uh, kind of an extraordinary situation, awaiting trial, pretrial, not yet convicted. So somehow it, re that book for me was just the beginning of waking up, of opening my eyes to the world, of realizing uh, that there was such a thing as an empire. I didn't yet make it the United States empire. Uh, I certainly didn't have the words for that. Uh, it was about what was happening by a white country to Africa. It was about the fact that there was a resistance movement and the occupying forces were afraid. Um, and it was about terror and really coming home to the war on terror. So this was really before John Burge and Chicago police torture. But I had the opportunity all these years later to come back around and join all the people who were working on the Burge torture cases. Do you, remember, do you know John Burge? Um, and so, you know, it took 20 years, time after time after time, of trying to uncover the fact that there was systemic police torture of African American suspects in one police station, Area 2, on the south side of Chicago. And while that was very concentrated and isolated, everyone was in on it. Everyone was in on it. Everyone knew. And everyone knew for those 20 years. Prosecutor's office, the judges, other police officers, people who came and went out of police stations, and that, you know, secretaries and so on. Everybody knew that this was happening in Chicago. And yet it took until 2008 before John Birch was indicted on federal charges, kind of Al Capone-like of tax it wasn't tax evasion, but it was perjury charges, not torture charges. And he was actually convicted and sent to prison for maximum sentence of something, 33 months? Does somebody else here know? Hmm? Yeah, but I think he got out in two and a half or three years, something like that. So I guess the question for me then is about, you know, how we, what we open our eyes to <laughs> and what serious matters we use in schools or allow our students to find and to think about and to, and even if we don't know what's happening there, to assume that somehow lights are going on or seeds are being planted or flames are being lit and that sometime you'll come to revisit that kind of apparatus and ask kind of the big questions, who we are, how did we get here, what do we want? Thank you.